apps. Apps have certainly transformed the way we use technology. App Annie Intelligence tracked products from Google's Android and Apple's iOS, the world's biggest app platforms. And the US and China dominated the app market in terms of downloads throughout 2015. Facebook products hold the top three spots with 360 mobile technology and Instagram rounding out the top five. And the app market gets ever more crowded every year. Tech research firm Gartner claims that by 2017, mobile apps will be downloaded more than 268 billion times, and that should generate revenue of more than 77 billion. And with a growing number of apps and app downloads, some analysts are predicting that we are heading into bubble territory. To explore the outlook of the app market, I'm joined by Justin Kuzmoski, president of NAV Valuation and Advisory. Justin, good to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Anytime. Thank you, Michelle. Well, Justin, it does feel like there is, uh, to quote Greenspan, some irrational exuberance in the app market at the moment. They're just on Apple alone, on the App Store alone, they're 1.6 million apps. And there's a lot of apprehension, pun intended, that we mm -hmm. are entering bubble territory. Does this feel like it's 1999 all over again? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there definitely is an oversaturation of apps. Apps keep on popping up every day. And there seems like an endless supply of apps that seem to arise every day. The reality is, according to industry data, Vision Mobile, 50% of Apple app developers and 65% of Android app developers only make $500 per app per month. So what does that say? There's clearly an oversupply in my opinion. Listen, everybody is chasing the next big unicorn dream, whether it's the WhatsApp that was bought by Facebook for $19 billion or Snapchat, which is rumored to be valued in the billions of dollars. The reality is chasing a dream when most of the apps are free or limited downloads of only a few dollars is a very risky business model. Well, Justin, it feels like it has all the makings of a bubble. I remember mm -hmm. before the housing bubble, every third person you spoke to was like, yeah, I'm buying another house and flipping another house. Now right. it seems like every third person I speak to says, oh yeah, I've invested some money in an app. But the question is, how can all of these apps that you've just mentioned monetize? You said that about 50% uh, are coming in at under $500 per month. What are the main revenue streams? Well, I think there's two main streams, Michelle, as we know. You have digital advertising, which can be for Spotify, ads that run when you stream music or in other types of gaming apps. The advertising revenue is there or one-time downloads, but the reality is we are in the early stages of mobile advertising. People have been talking about mobile advertising for the past 10 years, even before the advent and growth of the smartphone market. Mobile advertising market for apps right now is at $28 billion, expected to grow to $65 billion. But the reality is they are too many apps, millions of apps that can't capture that market. And if it plays out like the early stage of the internet, which I think it will, only the top 100 or so, or maybe 500 apps will capture any slice of that market, leaving millions of dollars of apps without any source of revenue. Well, it's very interesting because mm. you have the advertising revenue that is now mm. supporting so many different business models, mm. be it from apps to social media, to the internet, to traditional media like television, like mm. print, like radio. How is this sustainable? How can advertising sales support so many different economies? I think it really just isn't sustainable. I mean, a lot of the apps that are touted as the next big thing have built in a recurring user base. The dating apps have gone the model of giving out the app for free, hoping to get advertising down the road, but most importantly, to get subscribers at some point. So unless the app is expected to generate recurring downloads or recurring users, Tapping into that advertising is really just not a possibility for the vast majority of apps. But you have uh, these venture capital firms valuating these mm -hmm. apps at astronomical prices compared to potential earnings, potential revenue stream. Mm -hmm. Why is there so much overvaluation in the app market? Well, really, from the overvaluation standpoint, there is just too much money chasing too few investments. Higher amounts of money are coming in this cycle comparison to previous cycles from mutual funds and hedge funds, more money, simply put, is pumping up values. My favorite example of a potential bubble is the case of Zynga. Four years ago, mm -hmm. everyone was hot to trot for Zynga. 
Zynga is an online gaming app that is used with Facebook. They share revenue. Zynga had a pre-IPO valuation of $14 billion four years ago. Now and for the past four years is valued as low as $2.40 a share or $2.5 billion valuation, 75% less. Once these apps that do make it to public markets, such as Square or Zynga, are either trading way down or flat, it's too early in my opinion to really make a judgment about Jack Dorsey's Square, but it's definitely one to watch. It's been well, at least that does something. At least you can use that to make mobile Correct. payments. That has far more of a functionality than, mm. than the other apps. Um, and and we, we talk about these overvaluations, and somebody that knows a lot about technology is billionaire investor Mark Cuban. He's warned that this could be worse than the dot-com bubble if and when this does eventually burst. He says because there's less liquidity, it's not like a stock market where there is some way to then get your money out. How do you think this could be worse, and how does it then translate to the average investor or the average person? The re Mark Cuban is 100% right. What Mark Cuban is trying to say is, even within the internet companies, it is much riskier to invest in a private app where you'll never get your money back than a publicly traded internet company from the graveyard of the late 90s, such as the globe.com or pets.com. Back then, if you didn't like those internet companies and you wanted to get rid of them, you called your broker, you traded online, you liquidated your position within a few seconds. You put money into a private company such as an app that's pre-revenue and no chance of monetizing right. in the early stages, it's very unlikely that you'll get that money back. Justin, very risky. Justin, very quickly, if we are seeing the writing on the wall, how can we then, those that want to take the risk, mm. benefit from potentially shorting this, from betting that this bubble will burst? Well, I wish we could short all the apps in some type of ETF or some type of position, but. I think two strategies for in investors, whether mainstream investors or, or institutional investors, will be to short specific companies such as Square or Zynga that where you can short because they're traded. But one of my favorites is possibly shorting or buying REW. It is a pro shares double levered ETF. Basically, it, it used to be two, three hundred dollars a share. It's trading in the twenties. Buying this ETF is the way for a mainstream investor to bet that technology overall is peaking, and now's the time to bet against that market. All right. ETF, of course, Exchange Traded Fund. Thank you so much, Justin Kuzmarski, President of NAV Valuation and Advisory.